Uh, for th hopefully you have seen the uh, announcement for lab test one, which is going to occur next week. I will spend the next 10 minutes today in the class to talk about the lab test one, to give you some idea, okay? So I'm hoping to minimize the amount of code you have to memorize. It's not as hard as you might think, okay? We'll talk about it in the last 10 minutes. So today we'll talk about something also relevant to the lab test. Basically, every lecture up to and including today might be covered in the lab test one. Okay, so let's uh, talk about it. I want to just go back to the uh, classes and objects. We did some very informal example last time about the points. I will, I will expand that point example in just a moment, but I would like to just go back to the very beginning why we need object orientation. Okay, let's just talk about it first, and then we'll get to the examples and develop more uh, further. Okay, okay. So now, let's try to remember what we have learned so far. What we have learned so far is for lab number one, two, and three, we want to have a separation of concerns. So how many concerns do we have? One concern is we want to have the GUI, the uh, drag and drop GUI components, buttons, text view, text fields, spinner. That's the GUI part. And it's going to actually stay more or less the same throughout the course. So you're pretty much done all the learning for the GUI part for this course. And the second concern is about controller. What's, what's really controller? Controller also does something very standard. It simply try to retrieve the input from the GUI components using their ID. And also try to register some methods in the controller to the GUI, for example, button. That's something you're trying to do for lab number three, and also one and two. And the controller somehow also is trying to make some connection. Okay, let me just show you some uh, writing over here. And that will, I will get to why we need object orientation. So we talk about the model view controller pattern here, which I will do more formal introduction after reading week. The reason being, I want you to struggle enough about the different labs before we formally introduce that, so we appreciate that more. So we got a view over here, so that's gonna be your .xml file, where you can have the text view, or you can have the design view. And this part here, as I said, you are pretty much done with all the learning about this. We got text view, we have spinner, and we have a uh, text field, and also we got buttons. Okay, so these are the four we have learned so far. There might just be maximum one or two more you have to learn, but they're very standard, which I'll show you videos about how you can use them. Okay, view is done. What about controller? The controller itself is also very standard. So the way we do the controller is, we first of all, itself is also a Java class, usually something activity.java. So there should be only three things you should do in the controller part, okay? I will just outline that. And we have seen all of three so far. One is you want to retrieve the inputs. Retrieve the inputs from your GUI, for example, from the text field that we did, uh, just simply use the ID, right? And also the second part is you may want to do some simple conversion. For example, everything that you retrieve from the text field is a string value. Let's say I enter the income or the weights or the heights as, uh, as the value. The string itself is supposed to be treated as a number. For example, over here, if I have a text field over here, if I simply enter, let's say one, two, three, four, okay? The way it is going to be retrieved to the controller is it's going, it's going to be retrieved as one, two, three, four as a string. It's not just a number yet. So the controller is going to say, okay, for this particular string, I'm gonna treat it as a number, in which case you will say double the parse double, the thing you have uh, used so far, okay? So that's a simple conversion I meant. Now really from pounds to kilograms, or from centimeters to inches, I'm talking about even simpler conversions. Number three is really the most critical part. Number three is, somehow we want to make some connection to the model. I would just say connecting model, and then I'll make it more elaborate in just a moment connecting the model. Let's talk about what the model is. For lab number one, okay, let me say model over here, and the model is just going to be just another Java class. In lab number one, the model you have is called person, person.java. And for lab number two, you got something called taxpayer.java. And for lab, lab number three, which hopefully have started, that one, we got something called game.java, okay? So you can think about up to now, every time for each lab, we're just gonna have a each, uh, only one class for the model. But in general, when you're handling more complicated problems, you might have multiple classes. Okay, so now, how do we make a connection? 
to the model. So here's the issue, okay? I'm gonna talk about object orientation more in just a moment. But now you can think about every class in the Java, you're going to have some, something called constructor, okay? For example, if you have pers uh, let's say class person over here, and then over here you have a constructor here called person. And the person is gonna take some parameters over here and then the definition. I'll just sketch that. Now, how do we make a connection to there, okay? The way we do that is by saying, let's say from controller to the model. The way we do this is by saying person is, and then we say user, is assigned to new person. And then whatever information you need. And this information here is gonna be related to what you retrieved from one and two. Okay, you have seen those already. That's basically like a 3.1, okay? We talk about number three. What about 3.2? So once you created this particular model object, let's say person, taxpayer, or game, what you want to do is, you want to say, once I create a model using the input, input values I retrieve from the GUI, I'm gonna cause some complicated computations on the model. How do I do that? For example, let's say in the person class, we also get, a muta uh, let's say we got an uh, accessor method called double get BMI, for example. Get BMI, or it can be get your text uh, due, okay? So this is just another thing over here. So now, if I want to get something back from the model because I just created an object or variable of type uh, person, in that case, I can call whatever that's relevant the method on, th on this particular object, okay? So I'm just gonna use another color over here. So now, what we can get back from the model over here is to say, for example, I can say user dot to string. That's one case. You can imagine every computation is gonna be somehow initiated in the to string method. Or you can say user dot get BMI. So that's kind of the connection we have learned so far, okay? So now, what we're gonna focus on for today is how we can do this model part. And this part is really the most uh, important learning outcome for this course. For the view and for the controller, they are simply just standard. Once you really get it, they, they will pretty much be fixed. You, they won't be expanded much further. It's really the model part that's really complicated. And once you get to later classes, let's say 2030, 3311, you will learn even more design ideas about this particular model part. For this course, we'll just introduce you the fundamentals. Okay. Any questions up to now? Okay. Let's now just go back to the uh, of the separation of concerns. So I talk about them. And one more thing to say. Okay, for this particular model part over here, for now, the way for us to test model view controller altogether, the way to do it is by connecting your computer to a physical tablet and then launch the app. That's the only way to do it. However, it's not very effective when you're developing a long project. Apparently, lab number three is gonna be more complicated than lab number one and two. So you don't really want to just test your app at the end of your development, let's say three hours before the lab is due. That's not the way to go. What you really want to do is, every time when you're done with one particular method in your class, you want to test it right away. So that's the test-driven developments I tried to uh, show you in the tutorial series. So conce uh, conceptually, you can think about, there is just another box over here, okay? I just call it tester, okay, tester. Which means, as soon as you're done with some part of your model, you should really test right away, okay? You can create a, person class, you can try to call methods on that and try to see what the output is on the console. There's no physical connection to any tablets at all. It's simply not necessary. So this is something called TDD, test-driven developments, which is a very good practice I would like you to pick up from this course. And also, more to it about test-driven developments is how you can do breakpoints and how you can do debugger. So I actually show you this on the tutorial series, and in, during the lab, I've shown also many of you how you can de debug your app, especially when it gets complicated, how you can use debugger and breakpoints. Okay, that's something that if you're still confused, if you see me around in the lab, you should really grab me to show you. That's really something I would like you to pick up, breakpoints and debugger. 
later on, it doesn't really matter which IDE or tool you're using. It doesn't have to be Android Studio, Eclipse, uh, or Visual Studio, or for any other tool for programming languages. They all support the ideas about breakpoints and debugger. So that's really something you would like to pick up for this course. It's very practical. OK, so now let's go back to the uh, separation of concern. OK, so this part over here, um, I already talked about in the tutorial video. What I would like to do, rather than just repeating the whole thing, so you can, if you see the tutorial video, you can click on that. I just added the link for you. That one's about 40 minutes or so. I really want you to really watch that carefully and rewatch it. Now, I just want to summarize the points very quickly from a slightly different perspective, okay? So hopefully you can gain different insights very quickly. Okay, so now what's really object orientation? Okay, sometimes people just call it OO. So for object orientation, that's exactly how we can build model over here. And one thing to note, for, for, mo for the most part for this course, we only deal with only one class. But as I said last time, in reality, you have to deal with, not to, uh, not to surprisingly, more than 100 classes. Okay? Maybe when you get to 3311 in your curriculum, you may have to deal with possibly 20 or 30 classes, just as a taste. Okay? But for this course, maximum two or three, maximum. Okay? Okay, what about object orientation? So now, basically, object orientation means you, your design is oriented to objects. And objects are the most general concept you can observe in real life. Okay, so what we talk about are entities. Entities can be anything that you can observe by your eyes. Person, chair, lecture hall, lights, uh, balloon, trash can, anything. Anything that you can observe. But now, which one you want to turn eventually into a Java class is completely up to you, what you need. If your problem is somehow to try to calculate what would be the capacity for this particular lecture hall, in which case, trash can would not be so necessary, right? You just need a lecture hall, okay? Again, it depends on what you really need. Okay, now I want to briefly summarize. Okay, the first step is called observe. Based on the problems you are given, you want to observe what would be the entities that are relevant to my problem. Okay, let's say over here we got, basically, let's again, let's say we got two persons over here. They're completely independent persons. Let's say one person, he has the name Jim. Another person, he also has a name, Jonathan. Now, one thing to notice, which is very, very important to notice, you have two completely different entities. Both of them have a name, both of them. However, their name values are different. It can be the same, because people might have the same name, but they might be different in general. Okay, one is Jim, the other one is Jonathan. Okay, also they have weights and height, let's say, let's say 80 kilograms versus 85 kilograms. And also 180 centimeters, also 175 centimeters. So these are the so-called attributes of the entities, right? Of course, in, in reality, each person has more than 100 attributes. You don't necessarily have to include all of them in your Java class. It really depends on what you need. In the case of the BMI calculator, you only need to include the name, weights, and heights. They are relevant. In the case of the lab number two to calculate the income text, you only need income, the filing status, and also income, right? It's different attributes you need, right? It really depends what you need. Okay, another example. Let's say we talk about two-dimensional planes over here. This is something I will try to expand after we talk about object orientation from last time. Let's say we have the way we're gonna, we're gonna characterize each point is by using the x and y coordinates. So let's say we have one point over here. Let's say it's simply just one, one. And then also we got another point over here. It's three, four. Okay, we know that this is the x coordinates. This is the y coordinates, okay? And then we know that this is the name, and this is the weights, and this is the heights. And similarly, this is the name, this is the weights, and this is the heights. Okay, let's now de define some terminology. What are attributes? Okay, so now over here, basically, you can see for this particular entity and this particular entity, they are the same kind of entity. They are actually similar kind, which means the attributes they have must be exactly the same. 
they both have a name, weight and height. However, for between instances of the same kind, you may have different attribute values. So in this case, you can see they both have name, but their name values could be different. One is Jim, the other one is Jonathan. They both have weights, but their weight can be different. One is 80, the other one is 85. Similarly, they also got heights for both of them. Then one is 175, the other one is 180. It could be different. Similarly, what about for the two-dimensional planes? When we talk about this one particular, we are just talking about another kind of entities. We just talk about points. Over here, x and y, so they are attributes. Okay, and then over here, the red one over here, so they are simply just different values we can define. Oh, sorry, not this one here. We can just have different values to be defined for the attributes. Okay, they can be just different. So you should really be very uh, clear about what's the difference between attributes and attribute values. Okay, any questions until now? Are we okay? Okay, so so far we haven't talked about any Java code just yet. But what you want to uh, really, un really understand is eventually all these concepts will be turned into Java syntax, eventually. Okay? So now one more thing. So so far we only talk about data characteristics of your uh, entities. But sometimes entities might change. They might behave in a way that's going to change their attribute values. For example, let's say Jim over here, he is a person. He might gain his weight by 10 kilograms, or he might lose his weight by 5 kilograms. It's very common uh, in uh, real life. So now let's say, let me just take the weight for example. Over here, let's say, let me use a different color here. Now let's say, let me use green. At the moment, Jim is 80 kilograms over here. Let's say for some reason, his weight has gained to 10 kilograms. So let's say it is now 90 kilograms. Now, the transformation from one value to another. So this is some kind of like a changes. That's one thing, okay? So this is something like a change on the, okay? It's like a change on the attribute value from 80 into 90, okay? Another thing is, given some particular entity, let's say Jim, we may want to get some information from them. We want to say, given your weights and heights, we want to know what your BMI is. And also, given a taxpayer, given your income and your filing status, what is the tax you should pay, right? So that's kind of the question we want to ask based on the information you have for the attributes. So now in this case, so now we can say that given that this particular person, we want to know what is the BMI, okay? So this is more like a question or inquiry. Okay, so we got two kinds of things that's not exactly like attributes. It can be either a change to the attributes or it can be some kind of questions whose answer can be depending on the, the values of attributes. So these are the two things, okay? One is here, one is here, okay? When we translate these kind of concept into Java, okay? When we, whenever we want to do some changes to the, uh, the entities, what we have is something called mutator. Mutator methods, that's how we change the attribute values. And what about simply to ask a question about the objects? In which case, we have something called accessor. Accessor means we just want to get access to the attribute values and do some computation about it and return some value. That's accessor, okay? Okay, so now, so this is only about the observe up to now. So let, let me briefly mention about the uh, model and execute. We'll talk about it uh, in mu uh, gr uh, much greater details. Okay, so now this is the first stage. We just observe what can be relevant to the problems that we are solving. In this case, we are simply talking about persons and points. And then the second stage is something called model. When we talk about model, that means we gotta create some Java classes, okay? The way we do that is simply by, I'll uh, just uh, sketch for you. Basically for every class, you have to put a name of the, uh, the, cl uh, the class of entities you want to model. It can be person, it can be taxpayer, it can be game, it can be chair, it can be desk, it can be anything. And then you have open and closing curly brackets over there, and then we're gonna divide, usually you can divide your class into different sections. So you can have one section for attributes, okay? 
and we got one section for constructors. And notice that the way I put constructor is not singular. That means you may have more than one constructor for your class. It's totally possible. And then you, have, you can also have different two different kinds of methods. You can have accessor, or you can have mutators. Right? Remember, accessor correspond to this kind of questions inquiry. That's accessor. And then when you have mutators, it corresponds to this kind of change that you want to do. Mutators over here. Okay? You got four sections in general. Okay? Okay, after model over here, we got the last stage for the object orientation. So now, of course, what you gotta make sure is for the model stage, you want to make sure you have no syntax error and also you have no type errors, which means there should be no red underline for the text in Android Studio. If you have anything, uh, any uh, red underline, like a compile errors over here, that means you cannot move on to the next stage. The next stage is simply called execute. So execute simply means whatever, execute simply means you're gonna allocate some, uh, some space in your memory and play around with the objects, okay? I'll just uh, put it in words very quickly. That means you can allocate, allocate space in memory for new objects, for new objects over here. And then somehow you're going to manipulate. And over here, when I say manipulate, I'm being a little bit vague. Manipulate simply means, given some objects that I just created, I can either try to call a, an accessor method on it, or I can try to call the mutator method on it. That's something we'll see today throughout the lecture. Okay? Manipulate objects. Simply, mean, we, simply means we're gonna call methods. Okay. So that's a very, very quick summary of the object orientation lecture. I'm trying to pursue this uh, from a slightly different angle from what I show in the slides, but I should really uh, do both. Okay? So this is really insight into what object orientation is beyond the syntax. That's something I hope you, you can also pick up beyond this course. Okay, so now we are okay. So now there's a link here for the tutorial video you should watch and also plus the recording of what I just said. So now let's go to do some Java programming together. Okay, so now these are also covered by the tutorial video you can just uh, go over, okay? So now what we will do is we're gonna do some syntax, some Java programming. Okay, up to here. Okay, up to here we're done. By the tutorial video and by my summary. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how we can define constructors and also creating objects, okay? So we have done the point class last time, let's continue from there, okay? So now let's say if we have a class like this, we say class, points, and then we can define attributes in this case. Uh, let's just go back to our uh, point class from last time. Okay, let's just go over that very quickly. Okay, for the point class over here, you can see we got two attributes. For now, you don't have to worry about private or public, you can just ignore them. As far as the, uh, as long as you put all the classes inside the same package, you can just ignore public and private. Um, I may talk about public and private a little bit later in the course. I don't want to distract your attention for now, okay? So now we got attributes. You just need to declare the type and also the name, double X and double Y. So that means every point entity is going to be characterized by two things. One is double X, double Y, okay? X coordinates and Y coordinates. And this is how we create an instance of points, okay? Let's review this very quickly. Okay, we're gonna see this many times. Okay, so now what I want you to see is this. Okay. Okay, so now let's see this. So at the class, so for the model we have class point. And then we have two attributes, double x and also double y. And then we have the constructor, which will have the same name as the class point over here. Let's say double over here. 
what should be the name of the inputs to this particular method? We have two choices. Either you can choose just the same name as the corresponding attributes. I can simply choose double X and double Y. That's one option. The other option is you can choose just different name. Let me choose a different name just for now. And then later on, you will see that it's quite easy to disambiguate if you want to just uh, save your thinking to come up with uh, new variable names. Let me say double new x, double new y over here. OK? And then we simply say x is assigned to nx, and also y is assigned to ny. OK? And let me now also introduce you to a new syntax over here. First of all, let's, uh, let's say this box over here is our model. Okay. How do we use this model here? Before, we, before I even go, uh, go, uh, go about using this model, something to notice. You want to know about uh, variable scope. Okay, let me talk about the variable scope very quickly. Okay. Let me just take it an aside. Scope of variables. Okay, like that. Let's say if I have a class over here, just in general, I will just call that class foo over here. Okay, now let's say over here, if I try to define any methods, it can be mutator, it can be accessor, it doesn't matter. Now if I say a method here, I will say void, which means it's a mutator method. And then I'll say M1. And then over here, let's say M1 is going to take uh, two parameters. Integer i, integer j. OK, like that. And then let's try the following. If I say integer k is assigned to i, multiply by j, just for now. If I simply say the following, first of all, you should know that if it's, it is going to compile or not, OK? I can tell you that the only line you have to judge at this point is this line over here. Are we trying to use any variables that was not declared? Thinking this way, what about the i over here? When I talk about this i here, which i am, am I talking about? It's got to be this input i over here, OK? If I try to use j over here, it's also going to be the j over here, OK? Let's make it slightly more complicated. Now, if I try the following, let me just use another line. Let's say, uh, let's say uh, integer i, j, k, let's say l, is assigned to the following, OK? At the moment, let me introduce an attribute in this case. Let me just put integer i over here. And then let me, you know what? Let me just uh, get rid of l just for now. Just make it simple. OK? Now, the only thing I added was only to say integer i over here. Is the code still going to compile, though? Okay? That's something we want to learn. Okay? You can see that maybe based on what you learned from the elementary programming, I said you should never try to redeclare variables. Right? But somehow you can see that over here, I have integer i. I also got integer i here. It seems like I'm trying to redeclare the same variables. Okay? But that's not the, the way to, to see it. Okay? Now the way to see it is, you should not try to redeclare the same variable within the same scope, okay? But somehow, over here, the i over here is, we say that you can think about it's an attributes. At the same time, you can think about it's a class level variable. That's something, uh, class level variable. Class level in the sense that once you declare that, it is visible to everywhere in the same class. So now, can you take a guess to see if I tell you that now the code still compiles? This i here, is it referring to this i here, or is it referring to the red i over here? That's something we want to see. That's the tricky bits. Okay? So it turns out it is referring to, let me use a different color here, the i over here 
is going to refer to the closest one. Okay, in this way, I is closer to the I over here, so it's, uh, it's referring to this. And there's a special term for this, okay? We say that over here, the input parameter I shadows, shadows attributes I. Okay, that's a term, shadows. Shadow simply means you can think about somehow I over here, since the I is over here, so when you try to use uh, is inside the body of the implementation for this method here, you cannot see this attribute I anymore. So somehow it's shadowed. Okay? That's how they define that terminology. Okay, that's one special case. So now, let's try another one here. Let me just declare a new variable over here. So now let's say we got another method here, I'll just call it void m2. Integer, uh, actually, let's say in this case we don't have any, uh, we don't have any uh, parameter over here. Let's say put it here. Okay. So now, if I say integer k is assigned to i multiply by j. Now the question is, is this line going to compile or not? Okay, now, first of all, we have to see the following. We have integer k and integer k over here. Are we trying to redeclare the same variable twice? That's the first thing to de decide. It will be a compiled error if you're trying to declare two things twice in the same scope, but they are not in the same scope because this is one scope. This is the scope of n1. Okay? And also, inside the body of implementation for M2, this is the scope of M2. So even though the two variables are both called K, but they refer to different Ks, okay? you can think about maybe implicitly under the hood, this K here is referred to as M1.K, and this one here is M2.K, but they're different copies. Okay? So now, declaring this K over here again is absolutely fine. Now, what about this i here? Which i are we referring to? Are we referring to i over here because of shadowing, or are we referring to this i over here? That's an important question. Shadowing or not shadowing? No shadowing, it turns out. Now, be careful, it's another confusion. That's why I show you all the confusing example uh, in the same slide over here. So now, when we talk about, uh, let me just use, uh, when we talk about i over here, we really talk, uh, let me use a different color. When we use to talk about i here, it's really referring to the i over here. When we talk about shadowing, it must be of the same method, because the i over here is really talking about those different methods from M2, so that's why it's not a shadowing. Okay, now, what about j? When we talk about j here, are we talking about a j over here? No, they are different methods, right? So that's why this one does not compile, because it's, uh, it's simply not declared. It uh, cannot result. One moment, yeah, does not compile. Yes? Which one, M1 or M2? Uh, the I over here, you're talking about this I over here, right? This I here is fine, because the I over here is, is referring to the attribute I over here. Yeah, it's okay. But, but somehow the, the problem really is the J over here, because J is not declared, okay? Okay, guys, uh, it's okay so far. So these, uh, these are the common scope problems you will run into when you do your labs. So I just wanted to mention that to you. Okay, so now, let me summarize about the scope. So what should you, what, what would be the principle for you to follow? Whenever you have a class over here, let's say foo again. Let me try to be a little bit visual to you. Let's say you might have different attributes. Let me use attributes uh, as maybe green. You got attribute one, you got attribute two, you got attribute three, okay? And then we also got methods. Let's say void, uh, let me use maybe a different, Let's say we use uh, maybe void 
uh, method over here. And then, OK, over here. And then we also try to declare a local variable over here. OK, let me try to use different color. What about for the parameters, let's say parameter 1, parameter 2, parameter 3. OK, and also we have some local variables. Local variable, let's say local variable 1, local variable 2. OK, so different color means just different decorations. OK, if you really want to see some concrete example, what about integer i, OK? Over here, we can say integer j. Here, we can say integer k, OK? So now, we want to know for these three different colors, green, orange, and blue, where can we use them? That's the question. Where can we use them, OK? So let me just use, uh, just to make your, uh, just make another method here. Uh, I do, I'm running out of space, but imagine that it's just another method. Let's say this is M1, and this is M2 over here. And you might have different stuff over here, and then the body of implementation. OK, let's talk about what we can use. OK? And rather than using highlight, I'm going to use different color here. Now, for, any, for all the attributes we declare at the, uh, at the class level, we can use them anywhere everywhere, basically anywhere inside every method. So I can say, I can try to use i over here. I can use different, so you can see we got three different uh, decorations here. We can use all of them, and also in all the methods. OK, that's principle number one. For the attributes, you can use them anywhere in the class, any methods. Now, what about the input parameters over here? That would be orange. Uh, I don't have orange. That's a pink, OK? So now we got these three input parameters. Where can we use them? We can only use them inside the same methods. We cannot use them, for example, over here. No, you cannot do that. Okay? It's like if you declare integer j, in general, it doesn't really mean you can just use integer j in another uh, method. Okay? Now, one more. What about the blue one over here? Let's say I'm trying to do integer k is a local variable to m1. Where can I use it? It turns out I can only use it within the context of this particular method. If I try to use k inside another method here, no, you cannot do it. You can see the two things over here I highlight over here are the things you cannot do, which means you try to use parameters from other methods or you try to use local variables from other methods. What you can do is you can use the parameters from your particular method. We can use the local variables from your particular method. You can also use the attributes inside the same class. Okay? That's something you should really try to get clear. Any questions? Are we OK? Yes. Sorry? M2, yeah. So in M2, you simply cannot refer to you cannot refer to the input parameters from other class, uh, from other methods. You, you also cannot refer to the uh, local variable from other methods. Okay? Guys, how about we try very quickly? How about we try? Let's try. Let me just create a new class. How about that? Let's say under example, I'm going to create, let's try. And then I'll simply say Java class. I would say variable scope. Okay? We just want to know if things compile or not. That's all we want to know. Okay? Okay, let's try the following. Let's say, let me say integer attributes. Let me just make it more ex explicit for you. Attribute 1. So now, as soon as we declare attribute 1, we can use attributes in all methods. For example, let me declare two methods over here. Void and one. Okay, I'll add parameters in just a moment. Also, we have, uh, let's say, another uh, mutated method, M2. Okay, like that. Okay, so now, that means I can use attribute one in all the methods. I can say attribute one is assigned to 23 or 24. 
And then I can also say attribute 1 is assigned to 48. They're both OK. OK, clear? That one's the easiest way, easiest case. Now, let's try to follow it. Let me not just put any parameter just yet. Let's only put local variables. So now, let's say after this, I'm going to declare some local variables. Local variables inside M1 can only be used within M1. OK? And I'm going to apply the same comments to M2 as well. OK? I'm going to say local variables inside M2 can only be used within M2. OK? Similar idea. Let's try. Now, let me just put a string, for example. I would say string, let's say ms1 is ms1. And then I will try to do string ms2. Method, uh, OK, number two. You can see the naming convention, ms2. OK, so far so good. You can see that we are trying to use ms1. For example, I can say ms1 is simply reassigned to ms1.1. That reassignment is OK, because I'm trying to use the same variable that's local to this particular method, so that's fine. Let me try something similar. I can also say ms2 is assigned to, uh, reassigned to ms2, uh, maybe 0.2, OK? Something like that. Or to make it even fancier, you can say ms1 plus, ms2 plus. Now, let's try to see something that's go not going to compile. Now, let's say the following. If in, in, uh, in the context of M1, if I'm trying to use M, uh, MS2, if I say MS1, that is OK, it's assigned to MS2. OK, you can see that we got a red underline over here. Right, let's move our mouse over and what, see what it says. Cannot resolve symbol MS2 simply because MS2 was completely local to only M2 over here. That's why you couldn't do it. OK? OK, I would say cannot compile because of MS2. OK? I'll, compile, I'll put it into comments. Actually, I will leave that so you will see that's an error. Similarly, if we say MS2 is assigned to MS1, similarly, this wouldn't work either. Right? Because MS1 was declared uh, here as a local variable for M1. So it's only usable within M1. But you're trying to use it in M M2. Of course, it wouldn't work. Okay? Now, let me uh, just introduce the last complication. What about input parameters? You can think about the input parameters are simply like local variables for that particular method. Okay? I'll just give you one example here. Okay, let's say integer. Uh, Input parameters one, integer input parameter two. Okay, now this is what I can say. Think about, think of input parameters of a method of method m one as m one's local variables. Okay, so now in this case, that means if I try to do things like, for example, let's say. Uh, attributes 1, which is visible to this particular method, right? And I can say IP1 plus IP2. This is OK, because I'm simply using the variable that's local to this particular method. However, let's try the following. Let's say for M2, we also got integer input parameter 3, integer input parameter 4, OK? Now, if I try the following, if I say attributes uh, one is assigned to input parameter three plus input parameter four. In this case, you can see that both cannot be resolved, right? Because IP3 and IP4, they were declared as input parameters for M2. That means they are local to this particular method. You cannot use them outside M2. Okay? Clear? Okay? Similarly, okay, let me just to be complete. Over here, if you try to do attributes over here, attribute 1 is assigned to IP3 plus IP4. This is OK, because IP3 and IP4, they are local to the same method over here. However, if you try to say attributes 1 is assigned to IP1 plus IP2, in that case, both cannot be resolved, 
because IP1 and IP2, they are declared inside this method here. So they are only visible in this scope. Any questions? And this is a kind of an, uh, error I would like you to avoid in the lab test and in all your labs. Right? They're tricky, but it's not that difficult to understand as long as you get a principle understood. Are we okay? Questions? Okay. Okay. Now that we understand, we got either attributes or input parameters or local variables. So these are the three kinds of variables. Let me just put them out finally, and then we can go back to the slides. Okay, so now we got three kinds of variables. Three kinds of variables that you have to deal with when you define your model class. First kind, attributes. And they are at the class level, global. And this is something you will have to do for your lab number three. Number two, you have uh, method parameters. Also, you have uh, local variables. Okay. Now, now that since I talk about scope, I would like to talk about what if you got if statements inside your methods. What should you do? Okay. This uh, the similar principle will be uh, applied, but with some slight complication. Let me talk about it very quickly. But it's easy to understand. Let's say this, again, okay. let's say we have class, let's say foo again, okay, integer a1 for attribute 1, and let's say we have over here void and 1, okay, let's say just no parameters, let's say over here we are trying to do if else if, if you say if, Okay, let me first of all declare some local variable integer i is 23, for example. And then I would say if i is greater than uh, 24. Okay, and then I'll do something over here. Otherwise, I will do something else. Okay, like that. Okay, so we got the branch body here and the branch body here, okay? So now what I want to do is, let's say we got, we declare another local variable inside the if branch. If I say integer j is assigned to uh, i multiplied by two, okay? And over here, I'm gonna say integer j is assigned to i multiplied by four. Just a different manipulation, okay? What about, let me just try to do, okay, let me just not say J, okay? Let me just say K. Okay? Now, let's understand what's going on over here. This is how you should understand that. We have this line of de decoration over here. So i is going to be visible to the rest of the same method m1. Okay? And then we have this particular if statement over here because we've got if and else. It's a single if statement. And we got two branches. Okay? So when we say i is going to be visible to the entire and one, the entire method. That means it should be visible to this branch. It also be it should also be visible to this branch over here. Okay, what does that mean? That means when you talk about the I over here, we are talking about the same I over here. Okay. Now, let's try something that wouldn't work. Let's say over here, let me use a different. Let's see, let's say we use maybe pink over here. When you declare j over here, what does that mean? What this means is, it's only visible to the entire if branch. It's only this branch over here that it is visible. 
So if you're trying to use J outside this branch, it's not going to work. Example, let's say over here, let's say inside else, okay, let me just uh, get rid of this. Okay, let's try this. Let's try two different example. Let's say over here, still we, I'm inside the else. If I say integer, or let me just say this. If I simply say j is assigned to maybe 46, is it going to compile? No, it's not going to compile. No, this is not good because the j over here was not declared inside this branch. Okay? So the j here is only visible inside this branch over here, the if branch. Okay, that's one example. What about if I say over here, let's say outside the if statement over here, if I say j is assigned to 46, is it going to compile? No, because again, j over here is visible only to the if branch. Anything outside that particular branch is not going to compile. So this one also not good. Do you follow? Good? Okay, that's kind of the thing you have to make sure you don't really make a mistake uh, for your lab test. And also, if I give you a block of code, Java code, and I, I, I might simply just ask you if that really compiles or not. That's something you want to play with. Okay, okay let me just uh, do a little coding example very quickly, and then we are done with, with this part. Okay? Let's try, try, try to go over here. Let's say void m3 over here. Okay, if you say integer, let's say i over here, okay? And then we say if, let's say i, uh, let, me just, uh, let me just make an integer i, okay? It's a parameter, it can be anything. And then we say if i is greater than, is positive, then we do something. Otherwise, we do something else, okay? So here, if you simply say i is assigned to 23, and i is assigned to minus 46. So both should compile, because i over here is local to this particular method, okay? Now, how can we make some local variables in the same method? Let's try. Now, if I do, for example, integer j is, uh, is assigned to maybe 46, uh, maybe 89. Integer J, uh, integer k is assigned to 190. Now you can see that, now I can make some comments for you, j is only is visible to if branch only. And also for k, k is visible to else branch only. Okay? Now, let's try the following. If I say like this. If I say j is assigned to k multiplied by 23, you can see that it doesn't compile. Especially if you move your mouse over k over here, cannot resolve symbol k. That makes sense because k was declared under this else branch. So its scope is only the one I'm highlighting here. So it wouldn't compile. Similarly, if I try the following. If I say k is assigned to j divided by, for example, 23. In this case, you can see j over here cannot be resolved simply because j was declared over here. That means the scope of j is only this particular if branch. Anything outside the if branch cannot be, cannot actually refer to j. Okay? So that's kind of the very, uh, we talk about quite many cases today. So I would suggest watch the recording, get, uh, make sure you understand. Yes? Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just make sure I know which line you're talking about. You mean this line here? Uh, the, over here? Yeah. Ah, you know what? It's a very good question. You know what? Guys, I don't want to confuse you too much. What about I just say integer i? Because typically, you don't really reassign to the input variables. Okay, how about that? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So over here, I can say integer i is assigned to something. Oh, uh, this 23. Good. Very good. Okay. 
Let's now go back to the slides and then we'll define more methods. Okay. Okay, so now let's go back to our person class over there. Let me just uh, give you one example there to follow through and follow through together. Okay, this is the uh, code I would like to do together. Let me just write it out. I think I do have some, and I'll type it out in just a moment. Actually, you know what? Let's do it now, right away. Okay, so now let's go to the point class over here. So the various scopes is meant to be, not compiling, it's meant to be, okay? Let me just close that, okay? So now, let's go back to our point class. We got double X, we got double Y, okay? So now, as I said before, you may have more than one constructors for your class, okay? Let me give you some idea what can be a more complicated constructor, okay? Now, let's say conceptually this is what I want to do. Uh, okay, let's say this. If I want to do two-dimensional points, let's say this. Let's say the points I want to initialize used to be, for example, if I want to do two and three, like this, the way, the, the way to do it, we will say points uh, P1 is new points. And then I would say two and three. That's how I do it, okay? Now, I want to make a slightly different kinds of points I want to initialize. What about if I want to make some points along the y-axis, for example, over here, or over here, or over here. So what's really so special about these kind of points along the y-axis? Some value there is actually fixed. X value or Y value? X coordinates or Y coordinates? For example, for this value here, can it be 0, 4? Really? Are you sure? Okay, good. And what about this value here? Let's say, for example, it can be 0, 1. Right? And then this one here can be 0, minus 2. So what does that mean? That means when you talk about points along the y-axis over there, the x-coordinates should be always zero. That means when you try to initialize the point, you do not have to say what the x-coordinates are because they're zeros anyway. Okay, let's get that straight first. Similarly, what about if I want to initialize the points along the x-axis? What's so special about them? For example, I might say something like this. For example, this can be maybe 4, 0, okay? This guy here can be maybe, uh, maybe uh, 1, 0. And this guy here can be maybe minus 2, 0. What's so special about it is the y coordinates are always 0, okay? So now, let's say I really want to have a special constructor for the points so that it's going to help me to initialize such points, okay, such points, rather than two and three. So that is that was a little bit too general because you want you want x and y being non-zeros. But now I want the points where either x is zero or y is zero. Now, how can we define them, right? Let's think about how we might do this, how we might uh, use the constructor before we define that. It's also a good way to design your methods, okay? Now, let's say this. Uh, let me just uh, make some notes over here. Let's say this guy over here, let's call that P2. Okay, that's what we want to do. And let's call this guy over here uh, P3. Okay, P2 and P3. So now, how do we create P2 and P3? Of course, you can simply say new points 0, 4, and new points minus 2, 0. That's one way to do it. Let's try another way. Okay, just to show you that you can have different kinds of constructors. Let's try the following. What about, I can say points over here, P2 is assigned to new. Okay, what I will do now is, the first input there is no longer an integer. What I want to say is, I want to specify for this particular point, is either along the x-axis or y-axis, either x or y. So now, to really uh, have a data type for either x or y, should we use integer, double, or character? 
character, right? For example, I can say, if I say for 0, 4 over here, it's along the y-axis. So I can simply say now, y means this point I'm trying to create is along the y-axis. And then, whatever I put over here, after that, is going to be the y value. I haven't defined a constructor just yet. I just want to show you how you may use it. Okay? Let's try another one. What about P3 over here? Now for P3, I can say points over here, and P3 is assigned to new points. Now, it's a little bit different situation here, because for P3, it's along the x-axis, which means the y value is always 0. In that case, I want it to be along the x-axis, so that's why I put x rather than, rather than y. And then, I'm going to say minus 2 is going to be the uh, x-coordinates. Okay, So this is the x-coordinates, and this is the y-coordinates. So you can see, apparently, for this new kind of constructor over here, so now I want to, sh again, you can think about uh, over here, this is the original kind of constructor. Okay? And what we are trying to do is, we are trying to define a new kind of constructor, in which case, the first input is going to be either y or x character. If it happens to be y, that means we have to set the y coordinate value for this particular point. If it happens to be x character here, that means we have to set the x coordinate value for that. Okay? Kind of get an idea? I haven't shown you the uh, method just yet, but at least we want to know how we're going to use this particular constructor, and then we'll see how we can define that. Okay? Now, let's do this on the paper, and then I'll program that on the uh, Eclipse, uh, on the uh, Android Studio. Okay? Let's try that right away. Okay, what, what we will do is, let's say we have our class point. Okay? And then we have, uh, we already got our double x, double y. Let's not worry about them. Okay, it's already there. And also we got our original constructor, which will uh, initialize both x and y. They are also there. Now let's uh, worry about the new kind of uh, constructor. Okay? So now again, the constructor must have the same name as the class. Okay? And now, we have to decide how we can declare the input parameters. So now, according to how I show you how we are supposed to use the constructor, we got two inputs, y and 4, for example, and also x and minus 2 as, an, uh, as another example. So now, what should be the type for the first parameter? It should be a char, right? So what we can do is we can say character over here, and then let's say I would say axis any name you like. I'll say character axis. So now, for the first call over here, axis happens to be y. And for the second call over here, the axis happens to be x. Okay? And then, what about the second input? The second input basically is just about, depending on what the first, what, what the first input is, you're going to set the second value either to be the y or to be the x, either way. Okay? So now I'll just say double over here. Okay, I'll just say value, val. Okay, so we got two inputs. You can see, you can see the way I'm trying to define my constructor here. Rather than thinking out of nothing, I simply think about, I kind of re, uh, reverse engineer what's gonna happen. I think about how my user is going to use my model class to create this kind of points. And then from there, I will declare my method signatures, my method input parameters accordingly. I kind of reverse the process. That's also be, uh, that also, uh, will also be very useful when you do things. Okay, now, how should we do for the body here? I cannot, for example, one way to do it, if you think about the following, if I simply say this dot, for example, x is assigned to val, in this case, this case will work for this because you simply assign the x value to be minus 2. However, it wouldn't work for this case, because in that case, it's y-axis, so you were supposed to assign to the y value, not the x value. So now, what about I try this.y is assigned to val. Again, 
you can satisfy one, one part but not the other, right? So now what should we do? If statement, right? Because somehow you want to do selective actions. You want to say if the axis that we pass as input happens to be y, in that case we have to set the y value. Otherwise, if the axis we pass happens to be x, then we have to set the x value. Okay, that's what we got to do. Okay, let me just write it out and then we'll program that onto the uh, Android Studio. Okay, let's try that. So what we can say is, so now this is something possibly new to you. We are trying to do a constructor or a method over here. Inside the method, we're trying to do if then else. You have, you have done your compute text or uh, maybe lab number three, trying to use if then else. But here we're trying to use if then else in the constructor, which is also quite common. Depends on, depends on what you need, okay? So now we can say if, now how do we know if the axis is x or y? We can compare their values, right? Since they are primitive types, we can use equal, equal, right? That's kind of the syntax you should know for lab test one, okay? So now we can say axis over here equals equals x. If this is the case, we do something, okay? Now, you can either say else or else if. Let's say we don't, we assume whoever is using this point uh, constructor is always going to pass either x or y. They are not going to pass z, for example. Let's assume to make it easier. So now we can say else if, I'll make it more explicit for you. You can say if x is equals equals y, and then we do something over here, right? So it's like a selective action. Either one or the other, but not both. Okay, so now over here, what we can say is, we can say uh, this dot x is assigned to val. And then otherwise we say this dot y is assigned to val. Okay, you can see the difference is, one, in one case we refer to x, in the other case we refer to y, right? So we have to know which one to take, depending on what x is. is. Any question about this constructor here? Okay. This constructor basically is a special kind to initialize the points either along the x-axis, uh, either along the x-axis or along the y-axis. Either way, okay, it's a special kind. Okay, let's do that very quickly and see what we have. Okay, if you just go back to your uh, Intro Studio over here, let's try that very quickly. So you can have definitely you can have more than uh, one constructors. In this case, we're going to say character char, and all the primitive types is going to be lower cases only. So now, to make sure you don't really spell that like a C over here, okay, it must be lowercase. Axis. And then we have a double val, uh, val over here. Okay, that's what we have. And then we can say if axis equals equals x. In which case, it's going to be the points along the x-axis, which means they only got x-coordinates. So that means points along the x-axis uh, always has zeros for y-coordinates. Okay, that's why we're going to say this dot x is assigned to val. If you like, you can also say this dot y is assigned to zero, but it's not necessary, okay? If you like, we can do that too. Okay, if that makes uh, more clarity for you, please, by all means. Okay, now let's try the other branch. We can say else if axis over here it equals equals y. And then over here, we can say points along the y axis Okay, along the y-axis always has zeros for x-coordinates. Okay, so now we can say this dot y is assigned to val, and then, okay, make sure you also put it back, and then also this dot x is assigned to zero. Okay, so that's the constructor. Any question about this constructor here? 
Yeah, so I would say since we, we make the assumption that the user will only pass either x or y, so let's not worry about it. Okay, we can say assumption. User of this uh, constructor only passes x or y for input axis. Let's make that assumption there. Okay. Okay. Now let's go back to the uh, tester very quickly. I want to show you how you can trace the program. Let's go to the. Uh, so far, we don't have any point tester. Let's try. Let's go for a new and then Java class, and then let's go for point tester. Okay, there's also several points I would like to show you quickly. Okay, point tester. And then to make a tester, we can also say uh, public static void main string arts. Okay, let's try that. Okay. By the way, the tester is something that will be given to you in the lab test. You don't have to type uh, things like this. There's no point for you to memorize this kind of stuff. Okay. But I'll talk about it a little bit later. Okay. Okay. So now, what should we type over here? Let's just try to use the two kinds of constructor over here. Let's say create a point for let's say two and three. Okay. So this is. This is actually somewhere that's not exactly along the y or x axis. So we can say point P1 is assigned to mu. Okay, we can say point P1 is assigned to new point. Guys, please. Okay, point P1 is new P uh, new point. We can simply pass new, uh, 2 and 3. Okay? Somehow, Android Studio is very clever. It shows you 2 will be replacing the parameter NX, new X, and 3 will be replacing NY for new Y. Somehow, it's very clever. Okay? We'll, we'll do the debugging in just a moment. Okay? And then, oh, let me show you something right away. Okay? Let me just uh, mention about one concept over here. It's very crucial. Because later on, when we talk about more, more complicated concept for objects, this is the foundation. Okay. I want you to consider the following. Okay. Let's divide this into two sides. Okay. One side, we simply got integer i is 23. Very easy. Another side, let's put something complete into context. Over here, we got class, let's say, uh, point. And then we got double x, we got double y. And also, we have our point constructor over here. We got new x, new y, and then we got how we can assign them, right? So that's what we have. Let's also put that into context. Okay. Now, I'm going to put another variable declaration and assignment over there. Okay, let's see what we can do. So now, let's compa com compare. Let's say point P is assigned to new point 2 and 3. Let's compare these two, number 1 and number 2. Okay, number two will only make sense if you already declare a class called points into, uh, in your project, okay? However, on the other hand, for number one, it makes sense automatically because int is a predefined primitive type in Java. Let's compare one and two, okay? Now, let's learn about the concept which you said uh, later in the slide. Let me just mention right away. This is how you can understand this. First of all, let's just look at how the names are defined over here. Over here, you can see all lowercase. And the convention in Java is like an int, double, float, or char. So these are primitive type. Okay, let's first of all understand this primitive type. All lowercase. So that means it can be int, it can be double, it can be uh, any of the uh, type that we mentioned in the elementary programming, except for string. String is not primitive. Okay. 
So now, what about this over here? You can see that according to the naming convention, we say that every class name must be capitalized, right? That's what we said before. Assuming that you follow the naming convention. So now if you look at that, let me say capitalized. Uh, sorry. It's capitalized. So that means, so now it's a new word for you to learn. You can also refer to the slides. It's called reference type. Okay, so now we got two things to contrast. One is called primitive, the other one is called reference. The easiest way for you to understand this is, when you say primitive, what does that mean? Primitive simply means you're talking about some value, like 23, just value. Now, when we talk about reference, the way to understand it is, reference means address. So that's something I keep trying to emphasize to you in case it still doesn't make sense. Think it this way. When we say new points two, three over here, we are not just going to create some simple value like 23. That's not how we do it. The way to do it is to define some specialized space in the memory and then to actually allocate different spaces for x and y, different attributes. So in some ways, it's kind of like a composite. Okay? You can think about address of composite structure. Composite in the sense that you got x and y combined together. It's an object. Okay? So now, let's go a little bit further. How do we visualize things? Okay? So now, these are the two types you have to know very well for Java. One is about primitive, which means they're simple value. And the other one is about any class that you, uh, you declare. Any model class you declare. It can be activity, can be point, can be person, taxpayer, whatever. They're called reference type. Okay, let's see exactly how we can visualize them. This is how I see it. First of all, when you try to do integer i, that means I'm declaring a placeholder, like a box over here, and then I call that i. All I can store is some integer value. For example, 23. So 23 is put directly inside this box in its entirety. Every, uh, the whole 23 is put inside there. Okay. However, the way we store objects inside this reference variable p is different. Okay? I'm going to show you the wrong way to see it, and I'll show you the right way to see it. Okay? Let me just use a uh, different uh, path over here. Let me, again, when I say points, and then p, one, uh, p is new points. Let's say 2, 3. Okay? First of all, what's the wrong way to visualize it? The wrong way to visualize it is to think about, you also think about P as a placeholder, like that, okay? And then you think about new points over here is, we are going to create some composite structure in the memory, like this, okay? That's how we draw a composite structure. Okay, let's say we have a point object, okay? Somewhere in the memory. And then, because for points, we got X and Y, more than one attributes. In this case, we got x and y. And then somehow 2 and 3, uh, 2 will be assigned to uh, x and 3 will be assigned to y. Okay? That means you're trying to store the entire objects, including x and y, both of them, inside a placeholder for p. That's the wrong way to see it. That's the wrong way. Be it's very uh, straightforward for you. Uh, it's very uh, Understandable if you try to think about the wrong way, because the way to think it, think in this way is pretty much like how you think about 23 was stored in I. However, that's why we got a distinction between reference type and primitive type. Okay. Now, what's the right way to see it? Now, what would be the correct way of see it, of seeing it? Okay. The correct way of seeing it would be as follows. Now, think about. We still, we are still going to create the object somewhere in the memory as a composite structure. So we got point over here, and then we got also attributes x and y, and then x will be assigned to 2, y will be assigned to 3. Okay, so far so good. But now, how do we store some value into p? You can think about p is also like a placeholder over here. 
However, we do not try to store the entire objects into P. The reason being, in general, you might have more than, you may have a large number of attributes for your objects, in which case, you simply cannot allocate that much memory for a single variable, okay? So now, the way to do it is by conceptually thinking that there's gotta be, if you try to store something in the memory, there's gotta be some address for that particular uh, object. So in this course, we don't really talk about hardware. You will learn more about it in, uh, so when we talk about address, okay, this is something you will learn more in EECS 2021. That's something you will learn more. I'm not gonna uh, go get into details for this. What you can think about is, this object over here is gonna be allocated and stored somewhere in the memory. And for that particular portion of the memory, there's some starting address. For example, if I, the starting address can be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, some binary number, any address, okay? So now, what we store is not like the wrong way to, of seeing it, the entire objects. We only store the objects 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. We only store that. So now, what's the consequence of doing this? The consequence is, later on, if I want to get the x attribute value for this particular point object, how do I do that? The way to do it is by using the dot notation. For example, if I say p dot x, right? You have seen some dot notation so far. p dot x simply means, now, given this particular variable here, it stores a particular starting address of some point objects. Go to the address over there and then look at what's the x, okay? And when I say p dot y, that means go into the address over here and see what's the address. Look up that object there and see what's the y value. Okay, p dot x, p dot y. Okay, again, now the takeaway is the p over here only stores address of some point objects. Okay, that's very important, okay? Now, how can we see what the address is? We can actually do that. In lab number three for the tutorial, I show you that also in the debugger, but let's see that very quickly, also in the class, okay? Let's see that. Okay, let's go back to Android Studio over here. So now, let's uh, make some points over here. P1 stores the address of some point objects whose x coordinates is two, and y coordinates is three. Okay, now what can we, how can we print out the address for this particular object, okay? It's very easy to do. We can simply say system dot print line. If I simply say P1 over here, okay? Now, by default, we are going to see exactly the address for this P1. Okay, let's see that very quickly, okay? So now, if I just go back to my project over here, I want to execute point tester. And then if I try to do run this main method here, let's see what's gonna be there. It's gonna print out some address, okay, which I'll show you. Is it because it doesn't compile? You know what, for now, I think somehow the whole project must compile. Let me do the following, okay? Let me just comment out everything in this particular project here. Okay, I'll comment it back so you can still see uh, the, the reference. Okay, let me try it one more time. Point tester here, I can say uh, run point tester main. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, Gretel is building. Let's see what was gonna happen there. Okay, now this is the uh, address. Point at 7481448482. The, the value itself is not important. You just have to realize it's some address. Okay, now, however, the absolute value of the address is not important. The relative value is important. What do I mean? Let me just go back to my point tester over here. Now, if I just do another one here. Point P2, new point over here. Let's say I want to just create another point. Let's say three and four. Okay, it's a different point. How do I know it's a different point? Because I'm trying to use a new keyword separately, twice. Now, 
if I say system that all the print line over here, now rather than passing P1, I'm going to say P2. So now, can you imagine what's going to happen, right? We're going to print out two lines. The first line being the address for P1, and the second line being the address for P2. The absolute values for P1 and P2 are not important. However, you should know that they should not be, dif uh, they should not be the same. They should be different because they belong to different objects. Okay, let's double check with this and I'll show you how you can visualize this in just, in just a moment. Okay, let's try this. Let's execute again. Okay, now let's see that we got exactly two lines printed out. Okay, you can see the first one is this address. And the second one is gonna be this address here. They're completely different, first of all. Okay, so what does that mean conceptually? I'm gonna write it on the uh, iPad for you, okay? Two, three, and uh, three, four, okay? Okay, think about it this way. Point, and then P1. New, point. Two, three. Else. And then we got another line here, point P2. And then we have point, and then we got three and four. Okay? Now, first of all, we should notice that every time when you are trying to use a new keyword, you're trying to create a new object that's separate from every object that has been created so far. Just completely different. Okay? Conceptually, you can think about uh, let me use different color. Let's say what's going to happen after this line over here. What's going to happen after the green line is we're going to have uh, a new object in the memory somewhere, okay? And then the object is of type points. And every point has the attributes x and y. And then in this case, 2 and 3. And then we also got p1 somehow is going to store its address. What's the address? Let's look it up very quickly. And for P1 over there, it's going to be 748, uh, let me just write it down, 748, 144, A2. Okay, if you go back to iPad over here, that's simply the address that's being stored. Okay, the value itself doesn't really matter. Okay, I'm just saying that. So this value here corresponds to 748, 144, A2, to this address, uh, to this uh, object over here. Okay, or you can think, think that since P1 stores the address for this particular object, conceptually you can think about P1 is pointing to this object here. That's how I would draw it. Okay, just say P1 points to objects, but P1 does not represent the object itself. It stores its address. Okay, there's a difference here. Okay. Okay, what about the second line over here? The second line over here, we try to do something similar. We just allocate just another object over here, and then we got points, and we got x and y as well, so they are the same attributes, and then we have three and four. Let's see what the address is quickly. Okay, the address over here, 1540E. 1540E, and then 1ID. Okay, so now if you go back to iPad over here, so that's the address for this particular object, which is different, right? They're completely different objects. So now, what about P2? P2 is just gonna be another placeholder that is not going to store the entire object. It's only going to store the address. Now for P2 over here, it's gonna store this object here, uh, address. 1540E19D. Conceptually, you can think about P2 is pointing to this object here. Okay? Guys, any question about this? It's really, yeah, just give me one moment. It's really important for you to realize every time when you use the new keywords over here, it's going to create separate objects and their addresses are different. You don't have to know the exact value for the addresses, but you have to know that at least for P1 and P2, they store different addresses because they point to different objects. Question? How do these outputs manage to get like produced? Like, do they, come, do they get produced out of binary math or like in the from the program? Or you mean just these two lines? These two outputs. Those, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The question was, 
are these addresses ever be output in your program, okay? Basically, if you only try to execute uh, this line over here, it's only going to have the following effects. It's going to store some value like this, for example, into P1. You will only see this address value when you say system.out.println P1. You only see that when you actually print it out. Otherwise, it wouldn't be printed out. It would be implicit. Yes, so actually the address value over here, you can think about it's random, but somehow the system, the Java compiler is going to manage that. You don't have to worry. You just give you some unique address, like a unique ID, okay? Guys, any question about this, P1 and P2? Are we okay? Okay, let me do one more thing for you, okay? Now, let's see the following. I want you to think about the following here. Now, we know that P1 and P2, they are simply different address, okay? How do we uh, make a Boolean value out of this to really assert that's really the case? Okay, what we can do is, we can say P1 and P2 store different point addresses. Okay, so now what I can do is, I can just print out some Boolean expression. I'll say print, okay, and then I'll say print line in the next line. It's out, okay. Now what I can say is, remember P1 stores the address. P2 also stores the address. Now, how can I compare to say these two addresses are not the same? Well, I can say they are not equal. Now, I'm saying that P1, the address for some point objects, is different from P2, which is the address of some other point objects. They are not the same. Now, would I get true or false in this case? I should get true, right? Why don't we try very quickly? And then I'll try to go, uh, go for more methods for you. Okay, you can see P1 and P2 store different point addresses, and the way I translate different point addresses is by saying P1 is not equal to P2. That's how I do it, okay? Later on, when we talk about something called aliasing, later in the course, we're gonna go a little bit further about how we can manipulate the addresses a little bit. Okay, that's something we'll get into later in the course. But that'll be good for now. Okay, okay let's go on. Okay, this part here you can just uh, follow, okay? So now, let's again talk about how you can understand a line like this where you're trying to create some new objects at the right-hand side and then declare some reference variable P1 which is going to store only the address of some point objects and then store the address inside, three steps. Okay, that's actually explained exactly over here. Okay, one, two, and three. Okay, that's something we have uh, repeated for many times so far. That's something uh, you should really get yourself familiar with. If you still got trouble, find me in the lab sessions. I'll explain again to you. Okay. So now, what I want to do is as follows. Now, let's talk about the person class. I want to go over some more examples over here, okay? Okay, maybe uh, what I would do is, you can, this one is just another example here. We just try to do uh, new keywords, but now we're just creating a different type of objects. Rather than point, it's gonna be person. Okay, similar idea, okay? Okay, now, Let's talk about how we can visualize objects at runtime. Okay. Before I get there, let me just go back to uh, Android Studio over here. Now, remember, uh, just go back to the very beginning of the class. We talk about how you can define a second kind of a uh, constructor where you try, try to specify the x or y as the axis. Let's just do that very quickly okay, to, be, uh, to complete the story. So now, use the second version of constructor to create points along the x or y axis. Okay, let's see how we can do that. For example, let's say we want to create, create, uh, let's say for example, this one here, two, zero. So this point is along the x axis because the y value is zero. Okay, how do we do that? Okay, the way to do that is we can say uh, point 
I would say, uh, since we got P1 and P2, let's say P3. P3 create uh, two zero along the x-axis. OK, P3 is assigned to new point. OK, now we're going to have a different way to call in the constructor. You can see that the point over here, we're going to call the second kind of constructor, in which case the first input is going to be a character. And the second input will be a double. Okay, let's see how we can do that. Okay, let's see this. So this is going to be along the x-axis, and then we're going to say p uh, also is going to be two. Okay, along the axis, and then the x value should be two. Okay. Now, how can we know that we have done the right thing? Okay, there's one way for you to check over here. We can simply say s out. First of all, what we can do is another new objects. Okay. Now, what I want to say is P1, P2, and P3, these are the three points I have created so far. They are not equal to each other. Okay. How do I do that? Okay, let's try that. So now I'm going to use some logical operator to show you. Okay? That's something you should really also try to understand why it can be done that way. System.out.println. Okay? There's several ways for you to do this. Let me show you two ways at least. You can either say p1 is not equal to p2. Okay? And also p2 is not equal to p3. And then p3 is not equal to p1. That's one way to do it. Basically, you're saying that they are not equal to each other. So if you compare them pairwise, they are simply not equal. So they are simply different objects. Okay, that's one way to do it. Actually, let's leave it that way. That might be the easiest way for you to remember. Okay, so now again, when we say p1 is not equal to p2, what we are really comparing is not the x and y coordinates. We're only comparing the addresses that's stored in these variables. Okay? Let's try that. Okay, over here you would say another new object is simply true. Okay? But that's something you should really uh, try to look into it. Okay, now let's see one more thing over here. How can I somehow print out a contents for P3? Okay, let me just show you a very easy way. So let's say s out over here. Why well, you can say uh, p3 is. Okay, you can say p3.x. Okay, p3.x, what it will do is, remember what I said before over here. Because we know that over here, for example, when I say p.x over here, that means look up the address that is stored in this particular variable go to that memory location and find out what x is. So now if I change p to p3, what does that mean? Go to the address that is stored in p3, go to that particular object location and look at what x is in that case. Okay, that's what it means. Okay, let's go back there. And let's see what we have, p, p3.x. Let's now pretty print it a little bit better. Now we can say comma and plus p3.y and plus like that. Now it should be 2, 0, right? It should be. Let's try. Okay, 2, 0. It, because it's double. So that's why it's going to print out 2.0, 0, 0.0, 0, 2, 0. Okay, the same idea. Okay, so today the, the most, uh, the new thing that we cover is how you can do two versions of a constructor. Okay, that's something we learned. And also about variable scope. Okay, let me just go a little bit further, and then we'll uh, talk about lab test. Okay, now how do you visualize objects at runtime? Okay, that's something you have to uh, really get used to drawing because when we uh, the later concept that we're going to talk about for objects and classes, they really rely on how you draw. Okay, that's something I want to uh, talk about uh, later in the course. Okay, let me see if there's any anything I can do quickly. Maybe this is something I should start from next time. Okay, maybe this is something I will start from. 
What about I start uh, talk about the lab test for now? Okay. Give me one moment. Okay, for the lab test, uh, if you go to the uh, uh, preparation guide on the on the lectures page, right? Also, you got my uh, an Moodle announcement last week. Oh, not yeah, yesterday. So basically, what you're gonna do is go to the preparation guide. Uh, yeah, you can go to PDF, and then you will see that there's a link for downloading a practice test. That's something I want to talk about very quickly. Okay. When you actually download the practice test and then open it, it's going to be some Android Studio projects, and this is exactly how you will be what you will be given uh, for lab test one. Okay, so you'll be given basically two things. Let's go over that very quickly and give you some idea. First of all, whatever you will be given to start with, they compile. Okay, they compile. There should be no red underlines. Which means when you are trying to develop your code in the one hour of the lab test, you should not introduce any compile time errors into your code. As soon as you do that, you better fix it first before you continue. Okay? Now, let's have a look at what you were given over here. You'll be given two classes over here. One, I simply just call it utilities. Okay, let's have a look at that. Basically, I also make it simple, uh, quite simple for you for lab test one. Let's say we talk about the class. Okay, by the way, you do not have to worry about how you can declare a class using public or private or whatever, uh, the modifier. You don't have to worry. That's not something you have to worry for. That's left test one. So there will be no attributes for the class. And also for the constructor, it's already there. Simply just uh, do something very simple, just nothing. Okay? So these are the two things that you don't have to worry for your left test one. What you gotta worry is it will be given a list of methods for your lab test. I'm not, I'm not sure how many I'll give to you. I'll give you maybe possibly two methods that'll be quite easy to implement. Maybe two that'll be slightly harder. Maybe another two that'll be even harder. You know, something like that. So maybe roughly five methods, more or less, to implement in one hour, 60, 60 minutes. Okay, I think that's reasonable. Okay, let's just uh, have, a, have an idea very quickly. Now, let's say you're given this method over here, most likely you will be given only accessor methods for lab test one, which means it's gonna be a method that will return maybe a double, a character, integer, string, or the, the types that we have studied so far, okay? You don't have to worry about things like a text view, button, or edit text, no. Don't worry about them. We're only talking about model. That's, only, that's the only thing I will test you about in the lab test. No memorization. No memorization is required for the controller or view. No. Okay? Only the model. Okay. Let's now see this. We have a accessor over here. So uh, also we haven't really covered accessor and mutator in, uh, with more example in the lecture. I would suggest review the BMI tutorial series where I do talk about mutators and accessors in detail. That's something I would expect you to know for lab test one. Okay? Do watch the tutorial series, okay? I will only talk about them possibly next time. Don't wait me for that, okay? It's already on the tutorial. So now let's have a look at this. We're saying that this method here is gonna return a double. That means eventually, you're gonna say return something. Now, for me just to make it compile, I just return something that's useless, okay? So by the way, you will see that in the preparation guide, I said that if you submit something that simply doesn't compile, you, get, you will get zero, right? So now, if you really get really, really stuck, if, if you simply just submit what I give to you, which compiles, you will also get 20 marks. But hopefully you don't have to take that strategy, right? You just want to get higher, okay? Okay, let's see. For this particular one, let's do it together. Basically, you are given the input over here, which is radius. So that means you can use the radius inside this method. What we want to return is a double value that is going to represent the area of this particular circle with radius. Okay, how do we do that? So now, you can simply say, for example, you can say double area is equal, is assigned to radius multiply radius multiply 3.14. Okay, just like that. And after that, you want to make sure you return area. A very common mistake is as follows. Let's say you still re, uh, remain this minus one over here, and now if you do the following, it's going to be wrong. If you say system.out.printf, dot dot 
print line like that. If you simply say area over here, no, that's wrong. Because we, we want the return value over here to be exactly the answer you expect, not to be put, not to be printed to the console directly. Because when we evaluate your code, we're going to have some uh, other program to run your method, in which case, this line here is going to be ignored. Okay, then you put it out, and then you should really know that this is not good. Never ever put system.out.println for the return value of accessor method. Okay, that's a very common mistake. That's not good. Okay? And then so there will be other methods over here, given four numbers, how you calculate the average. And also given three numbers, how can you return the maximum? And also given, let's say, four numbers here, you want to return Boolean either true or false, whether that's arithmetic sequence. Okay, that's, so these are the practice questions for you. What you will be given will be similar, okay, in the lab test. Huh? Which one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So basically what you will be given is simply some accessor method here with parameters. You want to make sure your return value over here is something that will match. Okay, now, how do you check during your lab test? This is why I also gave you a tester, okay? So now, if you go to your, uh, go to another class that you were given, I want you to go to also utility tester over here. If you look at that, over there, I actually got actually all the printout layout over there. So this is the class you should not change, okay? You simply just execute it and see what the, ex when you are given an instruction, it will tell you what the expected output is. At the moment, you will see nothing ex uh, as expected. I'll show you why. Okay, let's try the following. Because we haven't implemented anything yet, except for the area, okay? Now, in your t lab test, what you were supposed to do, right click on this te uh, tester over here, and then say run. So I'm sure that's something you have done already for your lab, uh, or your, or your lab so far. So that should be strange to you. If you run the tester over here, okay, and then you will see that it's going to give you things like this. It'll tell you for the first output simply is 7, 78.5. Actually, this is something I just implemented for you, so that's why it's correct. However, you can see that area of circle 5 is still returning minus 1, so that's not good. Okay, that's something you want to actually uh, fix. Okay, and also average of these numbers is still returning minus 1. That's because you haven't really implemented that yet. Okay, so initially when you run your te the test you're given, you will see all the returning values are simply just wrong. So your task is go into this particular utility classes there and fill in line by line the body of implementation for each method. And now, the question is, what syntax should you memorize? I would say very, very minimum. You really want to go over the elementary programming lecture and selection lecture that we have gone so far. And especially for its arithmetic sequence method, the last one, it's gonna require some if then else. As long as you can master the basic syntax for Java, not even the uh, how to declare a method like a void or things like a public or private, no, not these. Only the elementary programming lecture I show you and selections. And also if you go over the uh, classes and objects lecture, that will also be useful. Okay, you got at least one week to prepare. Okay, any question about the lab test? Only, uh, most likely, just accessor. Yeah. You only, huh? Only, you only have to do what's inside the method. Yes, yes, correct. Okay, guys, any questions? Okay, well, let me just also give you a friendly reminder. Your lab number three is not really due the next week because the next week is lab test. But I will, try, I will suggest that you do try to finish your lab number three the most part of it this week. And you can come to as many lab sessions as you like to get help. Because for next week, we are not gonna run any lab sessions. It's gonna be lab test. And the week after, lab number three is due. So don't really procrastinate. Okay, that's my friendly advice to you. Okay, I'll see you in the labs.